Welcome. I like to keep what I do on this channel open. So I've got no fixed idea on what I'm going to do in the long term. But in the medium term, one of the things that I want to do and am doing is featuring the Inklings. By the Inklings, I mean basically four people. Owen Barfield, Charles Williams, both of whom I've done vlogs on, and then the two more famous Inklings, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. So this one is on C.S. Lewis. All the key Inklings were primarily friends with Lewis and secondarily with one another. The Inklings' original meetings were held in Lewis's rooms at Oxford. I have come to like Lewis, although he is not my favourite, or I think the greatest Inkling, but in many ways his work has the broadest reach. He may lack the intensity the other three have in spades. Barfield writes of Lewis, C.S. Lewis was for me, first and foremost, the absolute unforgettable friend, the friend with whom I was in close touch for over forty years, the friend who might be regarded hardly as another human being, but almost as part of the furniture of my existence. Lewis certainly had a gift for friendship. But Barfield also writes about Lewis's influence on him as a thinker. I told him, Lewis, that he ought to add that it was he that taught me to think at all, and that Lewis refused to take philosophy as a merely academic exercise. Barfield also saw the philanthropic side of Lewis, as he acted not only as an inkling, but as personal lawyer who administered the pretty significant funds that Lewis earned from publishing and funneled it into charitable activity. Lewis was certainly not materialistic in the sense of wanting to acquire significant possessions and material wealth. Lewis's work is multifaceted. He did Christian apologetics, imaginative allegory, science fantasy, children's fantasy, adult myth, literary criticism and autobiography, as well as being an extensive letter writer, not just to his friends, family and peers, but also to numerous fans who wrote to him. I've chosen a few excerpts to highlight the principal ideas and qualities of C.S. Lewis's work on rereading books. In literature, the characteristics of the consumer of bad art are even easier to define. He or she may want her weekly ration of fiction very badly indeed, but may be miserable if denied it. But he never rereads. There is no clear distinction between the literary and the unliterary. It is infallible. The literary man rereads, other men simply read. A novel once read is to them like yesterday's newspaper. One may have some hopes of a man who has never read The Odyssey or Mallory or Boswell or Pickwick, but none, as regards literature, of the man who tells you he has read them and thinks that settles the matter. It is as if a man said he had once washed or once slept or once kissed his wife or once gone for a walk. Whether the bad poetry is reread or not, it gravitates suspiciously towards the spare bedroom, I do not know. But the very fact that we do not know is significant. It does not creep into the conversation of those who buy it. One never finds two of its lovers capping quotations and settling down to a good evening's talk about their favourite. So with the bad picture, the purchaser says, no doubt sincerely, that he finds it lovely, sweet, beautiful, charming, or more probably, nice. But he hangs it where it cannot be seen and never looks at it again. On reading old books. Every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. All contemporary writers share to some extent the contemporary outlook, even those like myself who seem most opposed to it. Nothing strikes me more when I read the controversies of the past ages than the fact that both sides were usually assuming without question a good deal which we would now absolutely deny. 
They thought they were as completely opposed as two sides could be, but in fact they were all the time secretly united, united with each other and against earlier and later ages, by a great mass of common assumptions. We may be sure that the characteristic blindness of the twentieth century, the blindness about which posterity will ask, how could they have thought that? lies where we have never suspected it and concerns something about which there is untroubled agreement between Hitler and President Roosevelt note this was written in 1943 or about H.G. Wells and Karl Barth none of us can fully escape this blindness but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we read only modern books where they are true they will give us truths which we half knew already where they are false, they will aggravate the error with which we are already dangerously ill. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds, and this can be done only by reading old books. Not, of course, that there is any magic about the past. People were no cleverer then than they are now. They made as many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. They will not flatter us in the errors we are already committing. And their own errors, being now open and palpable, will not danger us. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. To be sure, the books of the future would be just as good a corrective as the books of the past, but unfortunately we cannot get at them. The next quote is on myth from his book, An Experiment in Criticism. I've only just read this book and I'd recommend it for anybody that studied literature as it serves as a, something of an antidote to the possession by fashionable literary theories and it encourages you to surrender yourself to great pieces of literature and be receptive towards them. What I like about this explanation of myth is that it's indicative rather than prescriptive and I think because of the nature of myth that's the correct approach. The pleasure of myth depends hardly at all on such usual narrative attractions as suspense or surprise. Even at a first hearing, it is felt to be inevitable. And the first hearing is chiefly valuable in introducing us to a permanent object of contemplation, more like a thing than a narration, which works upon us by its peculiar flavour or quality, rather as a smell or a chord does. Sometimes, even from the first, there is hardly any narrative element. The idea that the gods and all good men live under the shadow of Ragnarok is hardly a story. The Hesperides with their apple tree and dragon are already a potent myth without bringing in heralds to steal the apples. The experience is not only grave but awe-inspiring. We feel it to be numinous. It is as if something of great moment has been communicated to us. The recurrent efforts of the mind to grasp, we mean chiefly to conceptualize, this something are seen in persistent tendency of humanity to provide myths with allegorical explanations. And after all, allegories have been tried. The myth itself continues to feel more important than they. I am describing and not accounting for myths. Now, Lewis wrote a number of uh, fictional and mainly mythic works. His Space Trilogy, the Narnia books, Till We Have Faces, The Great Divorce. I just want to read a, a section from Out of the Silent Planet, the first book from the Space Trilogy. It's one that stuck in my mind as having particular qualities that attracted me to Lewis's fiction. But Ransom, as time wore on, became aware of another and more spiritual cause for his progressive lightning and exaltation of heart, a nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science was falling off him. He had read of space. At the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black cold vacuity, the utter deadness which was supposed to separate the worlds. He had not known how much it affected him till now, now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous libel for this Empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. He could not call it dead. 
he felt life pouring into him from it every moment. How indeed should it be otherwise, since out of this ocean the worlds and all their life had come? He had not thought it barren. He saw now that it was the womb of worlds, whose blazing and innumerable offspring looked down nightly even upon the earth with so many eyes. And here, with how many more, no space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they had named it simply the heavens, the heavens which declared the glory, the happy climes that lie where day never shuts his eye up in the broad fields of the sky. With some regret, I'll skip Lewis's Christian apologetics, as I need to read them more fully. But there are two works of his literary analysis, which I think are too often overlooked. The Discarded Image, which explores the Ptolemaic cosmological conception of the Middle Ages, and how it appears in literature and the imagination of the time. And The Allegory of Love, which is an exploration of the allegorical tradition of courtly love. Both books are impressive works of scholarship, but also very engaging reads. Lewis dedicates the allegory of love to Owen Barfield, and a central strand of thought that has parallels with Barfield is that through literature we can explore the way consciousness develops over time. Although Lewis and Barfield also seem to have conflicting opinions on the issue of historicism, the allegory of love explores literature from the Middle Ages and some things that we may regard as fundamental had not emerged. Specifically, the romantic love story that leads to marriage, which now seems such a cliché. In courtly love, adultery was the norm, and it is interesting to see the way a new mode of love hammers itself out in the imagination of the poets. Whether they were leading or following the social trend, I don't know. But in those works, we can see the transformation Another interesting development that Lewis seems to be tracing is that of the expression of the inner life through literature, which first found expression in allegory, and Lewis found primarily on the Romance of the Rose, where the different parts of the personality are depicted as separate personifications. Later he claims that it was possible to do the same thing more realistically. The Romance of the Rose, Lewis claims, is the most consistent and structural allegory. The later works he explores use allegory only in part, mixed with other modes of expression. I was captivated by Lewis's easy engagement with these works from the Middle Ages, leading up to Spencer's Fairy Queen. That engagement drew me with him through all 450 pages. It was also interesting to reflect on how Lewis's familiarity with the Middle Ages is also expressed in his Narnia books, the odd mix of mythologies, images, ideas lumped together that make the Narnia books as stylistically typical of works of the Middle Ages. This book spurred me to read Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida, and I'd like to read the entire Fairy Queen and other books it surveyed. It would be great to return to this book again, when I am more familiar with the imaginative country it explores. Lastly, I want to deal with Lewis's relationship with another writer, George MacDonald, whom he regarded as his master. To quote from the preface of the selection of George MacDonald's writing that Lewis put together, I have never concealed the fact that I regarded him, MacDonald, as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. But it has not seemed to me that those who have received my books kindly take even now sufficient notice of the affiliation. Honesty drives me to emphasize it. And even if honesty did not, well, I am a don, and source hunting is perhaps in my marrow. And to end this vlog, I'll read from Lewis's autobiography, Surprised by Joy on his first encounter with George MacDonald. It was getting just dark enough for the smoke of an engine to glow red on the underside with the reflection of the furnace. The hills beyond the Dorking Valley were of a blue so intense as to be nearly violet, and the sky was green with frost. My ears tingled with the cold. The glorious weak end of reading was before me. Turning to the bookstall, I picked out an every man in a dirty jacket, Fantastes, The Fairy Romance, George MacDonald, 
Then the train came in. I can still remember the voice of the porter, calling out village names, Saxon and sweet as nut, Bookham, Effingham, Horsley train. That evening I began to read my new book. The woodland journeyings in that story, the ghostly enemies, the ladies both good and evil, were close enough to my habitual imagery to lure me on without the perception of a change. It is as if I were carried sleeping across the frontier, or as if I had died in the old country, and could never remember how I came alive in the new. For in one sense the new country was exactly like the old. I met there all that had already charmed me in Mallory, Spencer, Morris, and Yeats. But in another sense all was changed. I did not yet know, and I was long in learning the name of the new quality, the bright shadow that rested on the travels of Anados. I do now. It was holiness.'